folks, and welcome back. This is a lecture on Chapter 8, Social Media for Business Communication. And just to kind of set the stage again, I posted a link to a clip from The Office uh, where there's sort of a situation around some texts that may or, may or may not have been sent in a professional capacity. Anyway, it kind of gets us into some of the troubles that can happen to you uh, if you're not mindful of the difference between a personal text or personal uh, use of social media versus professional social media. So if you haven't seen that clip already, uh, go take a quick look at it. It's a couple minutes long to come back and uh, we'll get into the topic. All right, here are the learning objectives for today. We'll talk a little a bit about each of these, uh, explaining the characteristics of the emerging social age, talk about blogs, wikis, forums, and other tools, uh, talk about blogs, uh, how to establish a credible online reputation, and then the ethical use of social media for work. So really good uh, super topics. Uh, there's the chapter overview. As you can see, they follow those objectives again pretty closely. All right, so the evolving workplace. And this is something that goes beyond just professional communication. Uh, although really, I think this is probably what where professional communication has the most to contribute. Uh, to just about any company or organization. It's just sort of meta level stuff. This, you know, people that have really thought about this at a cultural wide, uh, from a cultural wide perspective. Uh, these huge shifts uh, that these uh, communication technologies have, have uh, brought to society and culture at large. So we see here, the, they start with the industrial age, the 1700s up to about 1985. Then there's the information age from about 1970 which is still ongoing, uh, 2025, and transitioning into what they call the social age. And so we'll talk about that one in a second. Uh, but you could think about the industrial age, you know, the rise of factories, um, everything from uh, telegraph to telephones to, <laughs> to uh, printing machine, uh, printing presses, and you know, all this sort of wide scale uh, communication uh, technologies and how that sort of went hand in hand with the rise of the industrial economy. Uh, but this is the model that most most of us are probably familiar with, uh, where you have the you know, sort of person at the top, CEO, uh, whoever that is, but you never talk to this person directly. <laughs> you have to go through a, a series of intermediaries, a very rigid chain of command, uh, very well organized, it's very efficient, <laughs> a lot of emphasis on competitiveness. Uh, respect for authority. Uh, so that supposedly ended in 85. We started transitioning out of it anyway. Uh, and then we got into the information age uh, where communication was a lot more, uh, <clears throat> what's the word, uh, uh, inter, <laughs> what's that word? I'm blanking on the word, but anyway, uh, it's more, two, more of a two-way street uh, extensive communication between teams and units, and we get to where people are respecting expertise as well as position, right? So even if you're a technician down here somewhere, you know, if you if you're the only person that really knows how to use that new software, or you're the person that's uh, you know the computer expert in the office, or somebody that knows a lot about you know this particular po set of policies, well, maybe that maybe that could trump or your actual position. So even if you don't have a you know, very prestigious job title. Uh, you might still have a lot of respect around the office because you do have that uh, set, that skill set uh, that nobody else has. So the, the knowledge is power. You know, they can't just fire you. <laughs> you know, they're not going to fire the only person in the office that knows how to use uh, uh, Microsoft PowerPoint. You know, that was something I ran into back in the day. It, it was always fun to me to see all these sort of high, high paid. Uh, CEOs, all the upper management. And I, work, I think I told you I worked at a, for a couple of temp agencies in grad school, uh, these big uh, corporate offices. And they would uh, have all these, uh, you know, basically folks in suits probably making uh, 200, 300K <laughs> salaries. And they'd all be gathered around PowerPoint just trying to figure out basic stuff like, you know, how do I make a new slide? Uh, how do I, how do I put this uh, background on it? How do I change up the the color scheme to match our company. So, you know, they would have to bring in somebody like me <laughs> uh, that, you know, had that skill set. And, you know, I think it was very humbling for them uh, to have to rely on, you know, basically this, this temp work. Uh, but it nevertheless, you know, I didn't really pursue that. But you, I could see how that would, uh, you know, if I had went ahead and 
started working there full time, uh, that would have made me a that would have given me a certain amount of leverage there, right? That I was that I held that knowledge, and I'm sure you can think of examples uh, from your own uh, on, on <laughs> from your own life. Uh, so, but the idea is we're moving from the information age into the social age, and so that's what we want to talk about. What is this social age? And they define it as an era in which people engage in networked communication, collaborate across boundaries, and solve problems communally. And so it's kind of this tripartite uh, scheme here. So it's change in the way we communicate. It's a change in who we feel comfortable or who we are, who we're authorized to communicate with. And then how do we uh, work together uh, to solve problems? So not just about individuals knowing their jobs and getting things done, but uh, you know, whole departments of the whole company uh, working together. And here's another set of terms uh, that are fairly useful. I think this was uh, Tim O'Reilly, I want to say it was his name, that coined this idea of uh, Web 2.0. But if you're old enough to remember this, uh, there was uh, something that came before Web 2.0 called Web 1.0. And this was back when people were using, uh, I think there was a site called GeoCities. This is the one that I remember everybody was using. But maybe you would want to have a website and that was considered a very geeky nerdy thing back then you know to have a website it was mostly academics were making websites web pages it was mostly uh, information <laughs> uh, but you might want to put make a web page to to wow everybody so you'd, you'll register like mattbarton.com and you would go to this and you'd get on GeoCities to make the page and it might have my picture there. <laughs> a little bit, of, kind of like an online resume type deal, right? Or uh, if you have some short stories or poems, you might post those on your website. Uh, but there wasn't any way for people to make comments or interact or create accounts. You know, you couldn't do anything like that. You, could just, you just went there to read what was posted. And that was the majority of the web. That was Web 1.0. Well, then uh, what, what happened with Web 2.0 was uh, there began to emerge all these tools that made it easier. You didn't have to learn HTML. You didn't have to learn JavaScript, uh, Java, you know, any of that sort of thing, uh, XML. You know, most people that have websites, they probably don't even know what most of that is. Uh, but it's very easy now to make pages interactive. You know, people come in, they can, uh, instead of just having Matt Barton stuff up there, maybe I want to have people uh, make it so you can create an account on the site yourself and post your own points, let's say. Uh, so that's a lot easier. Uh, expressing opinions, customizing and editing web content. So the big sort of poster child for all this back in the uh, 90s was Amazon. So Amazon was really sort of on the forefront of uh, Web 2.0. Uh, you might not even think it's anything all that uh, innovative today, but it was really innovative back in the, back when they were doing this stuff. To, you know, to have uh, the ability to post reviews about the products it was mostly books back then if you can believe that <laughs> but maybe buy a book from amazon and being able to go back to amazon and post a review of the book that was kind of revolutionary and people thought this was they didn't know what to make of this like they, they kept saying well wouldn't this lose wouldn't this be bad for amazon if, what if people post negative reviews of books and then people won't buy the books you know if they see all those negative reviews maybe they shouldn't allow that just have the professional critics on there only uh, if that or maybe only post positive reviews now but what amazon the sort of brilliant thing was that was that this actually did not have that effect it actually just made them all the more popular <laughs> it sort of became this giant company and you know, a lot of people would uh, there are people that actually like to read the books you know they'll read these if a book gets horrible reviews, <laughs> uh, they'll actually, uh, maybe that's the only, maybe that's why they hear about it, right, as well. Could this book possibly be this bad? <laughs> and it gets all that attention and they may, maybe they'll buy the book just to, could it really be that bad? Uh, but anyway, that was one of the things Amazon was known for, or I guess is known for. And you can even get on there too and respond to the reviews. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, that's the point. Uh, web one, if it was a Web 1.0 page, all you'd be able to do is just look at the products and the descriptions they posted there. <laughs> and maybe you'd have to call uh, to order it and, and talk to somebody. So that'd be a very static page. Uh, but once, once you're able to interact with everything, uh, then we move into 2.0. And here's some other uh, differences. 
and just kind of what we've been talking about, moving from that just passively reading a page uh, to being able to do something on the page, uh, create content, share a review, share an opinion, uh, change the content even. I think about a wiki page, for example. If you, a lot of people don't know this, <laughs> but if you're on Wikipedia and you see a typo or something that's erroneous, you can usually edit that page yourself, you know, make the change, make the correction uh, to the content. And you know, this is something that was unheard of uh, back in 1.0. This was this is like this, that. That would be the worst nightmare. You know, call that somebody hacked my page, right? They they changed my poem. <laughs> they edited my poem. They must have hacked my account. Uh, now, if you're talking about a wiki, uh, that that's just I mean that's what it's built to do, right? It's not really shocking at all. Uh, that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, be able to edit that. Page, hopefully not in a bad way, <laughs> but that's just a, you can you can sort of appreciate the difference in a mind in mindset uh, between somebody in the 1.0 world posting a poem to the internet uh, that's just there to be read uh, versus somebody using a wiki uh, for poetry. Maybe they want people to come on and post, a, you know, maybe add to the poem or change it up, edit it. That's I guess the web as is. You're right. There's nothing you can do uh, versus being able to customize it. Let's see, there was one here I wanted to talk a little bit about, too. Yeah, there's the, the uh, two bottom points here I think are fundamental. Uh, so the first one is it's not just about the computer, the desktop, or the last the uh, laptop anymore. Now we're connecting from devices, most notably probably your phone or your tablet. Uh, so you, you're just carrying this thing around all the time. And uh, usually a company has to think about the app experience. You know, they want to have an app, an experience customized for the phone that'll be, you know, tailored for that, you know, smaller screen, touch screen, etc. Uh, not having a keyboard handy uh, versus the computer experience, which, of course, you know, you have the mouse, keyboard, uh, blah, blah, blah. And so that's an interesting shift. And then also the, uh, the, the how much time you spend. So it's almost scary how much time people have always spent on, on a screen, <laughs> staring at a screen all day. Uh, but now it's even more so because you don't just stay at your computer from 9 to 5 uh, staring at your screen. Now you're carrying a screen around with you all the time. So you might just be constantly uh, checking on things, uh, checking the company web pages, the content, seeing what people have posted there. Uh, so it's, you know, it's more time consuming. All right, characteristics part two. Yes, yeah, so companies are adopting the social networking platforms that contain the Web 2.0 communication tools. And really, the, the, the reason for that is that it's, e it's easy, it's free, or at least inexpensive usually. Uh, and it requires a lot less uh, technical expertise than it did back, back in the day. I mean, when Amazon was, was making, you know, what made it so innovative, they had programmers, probably hundreds of, if not thousands of programmers, creating all that stuff from scratch, you know, the ability to create an account, uh, to, to buy things securely, <laughs> all of that. Uh, nowadays, you, I mean, just about anybody could, you know, you get on, what's, what's that, Etsy? <laughs> you know, how, how hard is that? You know, set up an eBay page or a LinkedIn account. You know, it, it's really easy. Uh, so that's the reason all these companies, even like little small booths, a kiosk in the mall might have its own uh, Facebook page, uh, uh, LinkedIn page, uh, Etsy page, you name it. <clears throat> yeah, and they'll have uh, user profiles, get on, create an account. Uh, they might have a Twitter feed, a blog that goes with it, wikis, uh, even let you upload files. All right, so the benefits and the challenges. So, uh, again, when I was uh, coming up, <laughs> Uh, there was this the common advice you'd hear from teachers uh, was just don't you know we need to ban all this stuff we need to ban Wikipedia uh, we need to ban Facebook uh, we need what was it back then uh, MySpace <laughs> we need to ban MySpace <laughs> just ban it all it's terrible it's bad it's a big it's a big uh, privacy concern it's a big you know people are being uh, uh, murdered every day on Craigslist <laughs> it's all, all this fear. Uh, that was out there. So the idea was we just need to stop it. You know, we just need to nip this in the bud. Well, obviously that didn't happen. Uh, and the reason for that is that there was just the benefits are just too great uh, for that, you know, just, just to ban it 
and not use it. It's just the benefits outweigh, I guess, the, the risks. There's definitely risks, uh, but I think you would agree with this. Uh, you know, the funny thing is that I, most of my friends that are programmers and <laughs> I know plenty of professionals that are working in places like Microsoft, and a lot of them are sort of the most paranoid about social media. You know, so they won't have a Facebook account uh, and they will have a, a thick piece of tape <laughs> <laughs> like duct tape or uh, electrical tape over all their the lenses on their laptops and their microphones and the, they'll even uh, I was reading a, a site the other day that said you should you should keep a uh, you should you should buy a cheap pair of headphones chop off the wire cut the wire and just keep that plugged in to your laptop uh, headphone or microphone jack at all times <laughs> so so that they can't uh, that that will somehow make it so they can't listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing. Maybe that is, uh, you know, these are the folks that work with this stuff. So maybe they know a lot more about it than I do. Maybe I should, uh, you know, jump on that. But but anyway, <laughs> bit of a, a bit of a, a digression. So some of the benefits, obviously, the team communication and collaboration, huge, and it kind of ties in with this last item, last item here about the time and resources needed for business travel. So we've, you know, the globalization that's going on not just globalization, but the interconnectedness, there's that word I was trying to think of, <laughs> is a lot uh, more pronounced now. I mean, uh, we're, me, I'm in, I'm on committees that have people on it from Mankato, Bemidji, uh, just all these different universities around community colleges. And it'd be very costly and probably not even worth it a lot of times to try to get all those people into a room somewhere. You know, the time at the gas, <laughs> the airfare, whatever, <laughs> it just wouldn't be uh, conceivable. Uh, but on the other hand, it's just so easy to, to everybody get on Adobe Connect, one of these uh, packages like that, uh, Skype for Business, and, and do this kind of communication and collaboration uh, online. Just, yeah, it's, it might not be ideal as sitting around a desk, you know, sitting around a big table, <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you know, you're not, sometimes it's just not an option uh, to, to meet face to face. And I think uh, increasingly, too, there's just so many benefits, like the Google uh, Docs. You know, if you've used that with a team trying to write a document, and once you see, or like wikis, and once you see how easy it is to collaborate and communicate with each other in that medium, in a lot of ways, it's more efficient, even, even then meeting face-to-face. -face. Let me put it this way. Even if you're sitting there across from the person, uh, you might still have, uh, you might still be using Google Docs uh, to, to collaborate. And there's lots of other benefits, and I'm sure you can think of several of your own. Now, for the uh, professionals, though, uh, you get to build that professional network internally as well as externally. So the internally, you know, kind of goes without. You know, if you work at an office, you're going to get to know the people that work in that office eventually. Uh, but this can go beyond that uh, to people in other offices, other branches, uh, maybe people that work for other companies even. And so it's a good way for you to build up that professional network. And then combine that with the camaraderie, combine this with the transparency and the idea we just need to share information. Not everything needs to be a trade secret. You know, I'm not betraying uh, St. Cloud State when I <laughs> share information with colleagues at Mankato or Bemidji. You know, the, nobody frowns on that. You know, it's perfectly fine. It's, uh, you know, it's even encouraged. Now, there are challenges, obviously, and some of these are huge. A lack of adoption and penetration probably being the biggest one. So this happens to me frequently. There'll be a product I think is great. You know, I remember when I first came to St. Cloud State, I was I was all about a product called Drupal. <laughs> is this, uh, you know, basically blogging software? And it had I just really liked the package. It had a lot of great features. It's a very friendly uh, interface. And there was another one I liked a lot called. Uh, one of my students actually told me about it, and I was using it for a while for for, for my online courses. Oh, Canvas, All right? So I was Canvas was great. I thought it was a lot easier to use than D2L, a lot more user friendly. Uh, all the students liked it, but the problem was nobody else was using it. So no other professors were using it here. So the adoption rate was limited strictly to Matt Martin and his class. So obviously it hadn't penetrated a lot of even a professor uh, or people that are like me that are, you know, kind of keep tabs on this stuff, hadn't even heard of it. Like what is Canvas? You know, hadn't really uh, saturated the way that uh, 
I'll oh, say Moodle has, uh, which is another one of these free uh, services. And so that's the adoption and penetration. If you got low adoption and low penetration, that's going to be a problem because even if it's a great tool, you know, I'll give you a, a famous example was Google wanted to have their own Facebook program <laughs> platform. <laughs> so they created one called Google Plus and they thought, you know, this was going to take off and it was, and everybody was saying, I had a lot of friends and again, I'm friends with a lot of tech techie people. They loved Google plus. And uh, they said, this is so much better than Facebook. You know, look at what you can do. You got these circles and wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it, you know, it failed because just nobody was willing to move away uh, from the, uh, the Facebook. <laughs> it just weren't, wasn't enough to draw them over. Uh, so it failed for that reason. And so I point this out because even if you have a great, yeah, yeah, maybe technically speaking, it is a lot easier to use. It's friendlier, looks better, looks nicer, whatever. Uh, that doesn't really mean diddly uh, if, if people aren't willing to adopt it and if nobody's heard of it. Uh, so that's a problem. Lack of permanence, you know, any kind of digital stuff can go away. You know, what, what if, uh, you know, like Google Plus, I, th I think it's, I don't know if you can still access that or not. Uh, MySpace, you know, can you get to your MySpace page if you created one back in the day? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, communication about the channels. Yeah, so if you've got six or seven different social media you're using, uh, this can certainly get confusing. Uh, we, I just, we just had a department meeting the other day. And we were talking about ways to recruit or basically market our program. And people were just, uh, somebody said Instagram, you know, somebody else said Pinterest. You know, there's all this in YouTube, <laughs> like all this stuff was kind of out there and we're, everybody's just going like, what, which one should we use and this and this is good for this. And <laughs> there's a lot of confusion. It would take time to sort all that out. Uh, distraction from work. You know, that's the classic one. Uh, lack of control of the information. Right. So a lot of, a lot of ways, uh, you know, St. Cloud State's always concerned about this, right? The, the idea of, well, if you're using this Canvas software instead of D2L, uh, that's the problem because that's not, we don't control this. You know, we're not, we don't administer Canvas the way we do D2L. And actually D2L itself has moved from this, uh, something that was controlled internally. Uh, so every campus had their own version of D2L, their own set of the, you know, people in charge of it. Now it's become part of the cloud. <laughs> so it's all going to be managed by uh, the D2L Brightspace people. Uh, so that means that St. Cloud State will lose some of the control of that information, right? They won't be able just to pull the plug on it, basically. Uh, lack of system for rewarding networked and team communication and collaboration. So this isn't just a problem for uh, social media. But, you know, anytime you're part of a team, uh, it can be hard to figure out, well, who did what? Who contributed the most? You know, your opportunities to really shine as an individual uh, can be diminished if you're part of this big, massive uh, team. And then dangers to uh, professionals, or challenges, I should say. Uh, one is lack of boundary between the professional and private lives. This one is <laughs> huge. It's what that clip from The Office was showing uh, was all about, right? Uh, you've got this, you know, maybe you're using Twitter or Facebook or D2L or whatever it is uh, professionally, uh, but at what point does that shift over into something that is private? You know, and the general advice is you want to keep your friends and colleagues in different categories. And there's ways to do this even on Facebook. You know, you can go in and set up uh, friends versus colleagues versus, uh, you know, clients or strangers. I mean, you can get however nuanced you want uh, with your settings. But, you know, sometimes this can get confusing and people make mistakes with it all the time. You know, one of the examples that comes up all the time in uh, teaching is should you let students be your friends on Facebook? You know, if they, if they want to be your friend, uh, should you accept the invitation? Should you reject it? You know, how should you handle that? <laughs> you know, and then most of the time the response is, um, well, you know, it's, it's, you can't really make a policy. It just depends on the situation. You know, is this somebody that's mature? Uh, you know, what is the nature of that? It gets complicated really fast. I, I typically think it, I, I kind of side with the, uh, the, uh, the, on the I, I would err on the side of no, just me personally with that because it does blur those lines too much. And even if you do go into Facebook and you got all these different categories, you know, I don't know how much I trust that. 
<laughs> you know, I think it's just uh, too much danger. And so what I typically say is, uh, if you want, I'll, I'm happy to accept invitations from students on LinkedIn because I keep that site LinkedIn completely professional. Uh, but my Facebook page, you know, that's just for me and my friends and family, and I don't like, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to cross that. <laughs> I don't want to let, let just anybody on there uh, that I don't know. Now, let's see, lower productivity due to multitasking. Now, this is another huge one. You see, you, if you're teaching, you probably have students and you see them on their on their phones all the time. And yeah, they'll say, yes, I can, I can check my email and listen to you at the same time. But of course, they can't. Uh, excessive opportunism and, and self-promotion. <laughs> yep. Uh, mistakes and incompetence broadcast to larger audiences. Oh my God, yeah, that's the one uh, that gets the most attention. You see it all the time, some respected business professional. Oh God, who's the guy from Tesla? Uh, what's his name? Elon Musk, I think. And you see him on, I think it was on Joe Rogan's podcast or YouTube video. So he's there. He's, I, think, I want to say, I didn't watch the clip. I was just reading about it, but they were, I think they were saying he was smoking pot uh, on this uh, YouTube video. You know, everybody saw that and <laughs> it just uh, really got broadcast uh, to this bigger audience. Maybe he doesn't care, uh, but, but I can think of lots of examples where somebody, maybe it's just a simple thing like a misspelling in a tweet. You know, so you're there, you're representing the company, you tweet something out about the new event, you know, the, uh, the <laughs> free fries day or whatever it is, and you got some spelling errors. And suddenly that's not just something that's internal. Uh, that's something that, you know, news media could pick up on this and broadcast it everywhere. So suddenly just a simple little mistake, a little bit of incompetence that could have been quickly dealt with and, you know, swept under the rug. Uh, suddenly this has been broadcast and it's permanent and it's out there and it's... <laughs> A <laughs> life scarring <laughs> uh, kind of event. So that's the thing that keeps you up at night, right? It's not so much, uh, you know, with email, you, yes, they could forward the email to people, uh, you know, and that certainly happens, but it's not quite as easy, easily done as it is now with the, with the Facebook, or the text messages and, and all this stuff where there's a permanent record that, you know, just take a screenshot of it. And next thing you know, you're on the news. <laughs> this totally embarrassing, humiliating. Uh, situation, whether that's incompetence or what. Now, you didn't want it broadcast, but it's been broadcast. So, and that's something that's obviously of a, a great concern. All right, anyway, enough on that. I don't want to scare you away from social media. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, here's some tips, I guess. Uh, so, organizing the dashboard to control your communication and information flow. So you probably have a home page that you go to maybe on your phone. I think a lot of phones have this built in. Uh, they call it notifications on iPhone. I'm not really sure what the what Android calls it. Uh, but you can go in and set up and say, I want, you know, post on, if somebody posts something to, uh, well, I'll give you an example like D2L. Uh, I create a forum on D2L for my classes called uh, Class Questions. And, and uh, you know some, something important, you know, if you have a question about an assignment, let's say something I want to get to quickly, uh, then I'll say I, I can go into D2L and say, look, this topic or that thread there about the questions, you know, I want to receive notifications on that. And so what that means is uh, when somebody posted this forum, it actually sends me an email uh, so I can get to that right away. I think, I think you can even go in and say, text me. <laughs> I'm just kind of making this up, speculating, but. Uh, there are programs that would let you do that. Uh, other things you can use dashboards for, you know, you can have it, if you use Google, what is it, Google Pages, or I, I typically don't mess mess around with this too much, but uh, there used to be these sites, I think Google News is one, uh, that will let you go in and say, look, I don't want to hear from this network, <laughs> or I, I do want to hear from, I, I want to hear everything about this topic. Uh, you can even make Google uh, send you notifications if there's anything new posted about a phrase. Uh, so you might have a, like most people put their name in there, <laughs> like Matt Barton. You know, if there's any uh, new content posted about Matt Barton, I want a, a little feed uh, to see that. Uh, so you, the point is you can really organize this to be efficient. So you're not just looking at a big wall of stuff that's irrelevant to you. Now, usually you can tailor this dashboard, you know, put the apps 
that you use most often uh, along the bottom where you can easily click on them uh, get the feeds from the news sites that you care about somewhere uh, just all on one page and yeah it's going to take a little time to figure it out and set it up uh, but the point is once you set up this dashboard intelligently uh, then it will pay off in the long run It'll save you a lot of time let's see creating a complete and professional uh, profile uh, you can certainly do this uh, with linkedin uh, blogs and status updates uh, for team communication uh, using the shared files to collaborate this is probably what sharepoint's uh, strength is uh, but i would also say google drive you know it's really nice when you can just have a shared folder on the in the cloud and uh, if you're doing a presentation a lot of times i've done conferences with colleagues here and we'll have a, a google drive with all our powerpoints in it and then we can uh, i could say well you know let's look at each other's powerpoints and see you know what everybody's talking about make sure that we're not <laughs> repeating information uh let's say uh, so that's that's a really big perk here it's that's easily to do uh, with an online folder whereas if you didn't have that and you were emailing back and forth or trying to move a thumb drive around you know that, that gets uh, tedious uh, solving problems with discussion forums big one and then <laughs> other social media tools yeah so this is just more information here about this dashboard uh, so i don't i'm sure you probably have this already uh, most most computers and laptops phones will have this built in uh, but you just tell it like what do you care about what do you want to see when you log in uh, i'm trying to think of what mine's called let me just quickly check my <laughs> phone here <laughs> yeah so when i go in to google it brings me to the uh just to my google apps page and there i have all these different apps i use all the time my, my email uh, amazon is on there uh, Twitter is on there so basically all the apps that I use on a regular basis are, are there uh, so I don't have to go to the individual sites I can just click the button and go straight to the to the page yeah most of the and then one of them is Google News I wish I told you about this right that I could tell Google News like what am I interested in what am I not interested in and it'll watch it'll watch you if you if you click on a certain type of a news article a lot <laughs> it'll figure out hey that Matt likes that topic and so there's a page called for you and these are news items that are if i click on this and i'm not going to show it <laughs> not showing it to you but <laughs> you know if you could look at it uh, you'd see that most of this stuff is like video games and authors that i whose books i've talked about uh things of that sort it's it's, it's almost kind of scary how well it knows me <laughs> you know i like uh i like to read stories about bigfoot just in uh, uh bat boy the week weekly world news kind of wacky wacky uh, stuff uh, so it, it keeps an eye out for weird news and post that on there too uh, so it's kind of fun i guess that goes into that time waste category <laughs> we're talking about <laughs> but anyway i could say look i don't want that there you know get rid of it you know what if the uh, the deans come by and see me reading about bigfoot <laughs> <Have a problem. laughs> see, in most cases uh, you can customize the dashboard to display the features right okay blogs and status updates uh, for team communication uh blogs and these are kind of a dime a dozen these days you just have to explain like what what is a blog you know most people were using them basically for online diaries uh, but you can find you know we talked about this i'm pretty sure how I, you know you could create your own professional blog uh, where you just keep you comment about you see something in the news relevant to uh, the topic your professional interest and you can have your own blog uh, where you talk about that topic you know i could create one i used to have one called uh, armchair arcade and that was just sort of academic uh or at least uh, intelligent <laughs> uh retrospectives and perspectives on you know video games classic computer stuff uh anything having to do with the uh, old old consoles ataris and uh, nintendos <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we, it was a group of us we had that and we'd post on it you know every now and then and the most recent items would be up at the top and it, you know kind of got to be got a pretty decent following you know if people are interested in that topic another one was called slash dot uh, that was the real big one back in the day and that was huge you know i don't know i don't know about millions but anyway it had a huge audience same sort of deal uh that's the excellent opportunities leaders managers supervisors to keep employees aware of announcements and updates 
Yes, I don't know. Does St. Cloud State have a blog? Uh, I'm pretty sure they, they have some announcements pages and things of that sort. But you know, there might be an opportunity for somebody to create just something that's explicitly a, the St. Cloud State blog. And it could basically, you could, you could just think about it kind of as a news hub. Uh, microblogs, uh, they talk about status updates here. I don't, you know, I, I suppose, I, I guess I don't want to use the word that I'm thinking of, which is t tweets. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of these sites will have Twitter feeds, and we have one for the English department. And of course, St. Cloud State has them. Just little, uh, you know, these are shorter ones. I think, I don't remember, I think Twitter used to limit you to 140 characters, but they have uh, expanded on that. So the idea with a microblog is it's something that's it's so quick and easy to you know, quickly post a couple sentences that you could conceivably do that every day or uh, multiple times a day uh, or even you know constantly uh, versus the blog which would be a, you know I, I typically think about more like an essay or at least a beefy parag paragraph uh, so this would not be as you might post if you're really prolific maybe once per day on a blog probably more likely to every couple once a week every couple of weeks. Uh, versus the, the Twitter feed where you can, you know, keep people up to date more often. You know, I'll just give you another, another quick example from my uh, my life. I keep this uh, YouTube channel going uh, called Matt Chat. And, it, you know, I, I used to post to it every week, but now I'm too busy to do that. So I'm only posting maybe once <laughs> once a month sometimes. But you want to keep people involved. You don't want to just lose that audience completely uh, in between episodes. So I use the uh, microblogs as a way to kind of fill that gap. So even if I'm not posting, I might posting a new video, I might post some stuff on Twitter, I post some stuff on, I got a Facebook page for Matt Chat, where I can just go in and post a little news item, you know, just to kind of keep people engaged. And I could certainly use that to say, look, it's gonna be another week before I post another episode or <laughs> nothing urgent there, uh, but you get the idea. Let's see, uh, blogs and status updates for team communication. All right, the team blogs. Uh, this is one that I used extensively as in grad school. We had a team blog called Kairos News. And that was a group of uh, basically rhetoric and composition types. Uh, people that wanted to be professors. And we pretty much, I think all of us on that blog did eventually become professors and get, get hired. So maybe that helps. Uh, but it was just a group. Of, there was Charlie Lowe, uh, Clancy Ratliff, uh, who were some other ones on there? I think Jeff Rice is on there at some point, and of course me. And we would just find uh, news items again, things from the Chronicle of Higher Education or all these different websites, but just anything that had to do with uh, something to do with writing technology, something that could be related to classroom teaching composition or English 191 is, is what we call it here. You know, when we found a news item like that, we'd post about it, put the link there. It wasn't like we wrote you know, essays every day, uh, just maybe a little paragraph about it, you know, why, why is this interesting? Uh, but it was really nice, worked out well for us, uh, because a lot of uh, compositionists, including some very res well-respected uh, people that have been doing it for years and years, would, uh, you know, they subscribed to this blog, and they were commenting on it, and they would see that we posted, and, you know, we used our real names, uh, so that when we went to a conference, so, oh yeah, you're oh you're Matt Barton. Yeah, I read I read your stuff on Kairos News. Uh, it was really kind of cool. It made you feel kind of like a little mini celebrity. <laughs> uh, that's just a you know an example, a personal example. So just you know I talk to students all the time and they'll say, well I don't see the point of a blog. You know what? Who's going to read it? Who's going to care about my opinion? You know I'm just a student. Blah blah blah. I say look, I was just a student. You know all these people were just students. Uh, we weren't professors. You know we were just you know, TAs are grad TAs at best. You know, right? Teaching, uh, you might be teaching, you, you might not be, but uh, that doesn't matter. It can really help you out. It's the uh, project blogs. Now, so this might, you know, again, just a temporary team just dedicated to a project, and yeah, you know, maybe you're part of some big initiative at your company. And, oh, ooh, I got some good examples here. Let's see, blog used for internal announcements. So you see, this is something that would just be, this blog would not be uh, public. You'd have to sign up, register, be approved. Yeah, but then you could see how they're using these. You know, and St. Cloud State has these, of course. <laughs> I, th I think we're kind of behind the ball a little bit because we still use these emails uh, for announcements like this. But uh, it would be better if we had a, 
there's been efforts to try to use D2L for announcements instead, but it just doesn't quite work because, again, coming back to that adoption and penetration, there's just too many professors here that refuse to use D2L. They don't care about it. Uh, they're just not going to do it. <laughs> so so they, they do have the email, though. They're required to have email. Uh, so that's another reason why. Yeah, yeah the detail would be so much better, but you know, sometimes you just have to face uh, reality. <laughs> uh, blogs used for internal announcements, uh, too. So here you can see the comments people are making. And I don't know what else really to say about this, but you can see... You, you can see the 2.0 features though. Like here you could reply to it. Uh, you can, what is this? I guess you could like <laughs> the post. <laughs> and you get a little bit of interaction with that. It's not just you read the announcement and that's all you can do. Uh, now you can uh, respond in some way. Uh, using the shared files uh, to collaborate. And you'll, you'll find yourself in this situation. You're working on a PowerPoint with a team. Uh, you might be working on a proposal maybe with just a partner, maybe with three or four people. Sometimes you've got editors, uh, you've got administrators, and it can get really tangled up and very, uh, you know, this person's doing this, and this person's doing that, and how do you keep all these files and the versioning? Basically what happens, you don't want to be working on a version of a document that has already been edited by somebody else. Then you get it back and you see that the changes are conflicting and it's just a nightmare. <laughs> Believe me, that is a nightmare. It's a lot better if you're using, if you figure out what protocol to use. So uh, I like to use, I, I think, a, I feel like I'm a Google spokesperson at this point, but I, I just, my go-to is Google Drive. Go to Google Docs. Let's get this thing up in Google Docs. Uh, you know, that way we don't have to be sending these files back and forth. It's, it's a lot easier. Uh, but I have uh, done other ones. You know, sometimes I've worked with uh, Wiki, not Wiki, well, I have used a Wikipedia. Uh, but you can just download that Wiki software, too, and use that. Uh, to share the files. Um, there's one, I think it's called Writing Spaces or uh, Ink Spot. <laughs> Probably should have looked into this before I made this uh, video. But just like with Google Drive, you know, if somebody doesn't want to use Google, uh, there's plenty of other packages that are similar. I think it's called Wet Paint, is the one you can use. Uh, organize your files by uh, the project. You know, this is again why I like to create a folder. Uh, if I'm working on a project you know, like this assessment stuff or my rhetoric caucus documents, I'll make a folder uh, just for the files pertaining to that project instead of just one big folder where everything is just, you know, all jumbled together. It's hard to find stuff you know, when you just have that one big directory. Uh, but if you have it broken into uh, folders by project, a lot easier. The same thing with your home computer too, right? Yeah, managing permissions is another one. So I don't want everybody just to be able to come in sometimes and edit the document. I might, I might want to just let people see it, but not edit it. And so that's something, again, you can do with the Google, uh, Google Drive. You could say, look, this folder here, I want to share that so anybody can view it and edit it. <laughs> I don't want this thing wide open uh, to the public. It's probably, that's seldom going to be the case, though. Probably what you'd want is, you know, I want anybody to be able to view it but I only want certain people to be able to edit it. You know, so you can do that with uh, pretty easily. It's called managing permissions. Uh, add comments constructively and carefully read uh, your colleagues' comments. All right, so yeah, you know, very frequently, you know, I have the Google Drive up. Google, I was just working on one. It was the trying to work out uh, some notice. We're trying to hire some new professors uh, to teach composition. So. Uh, we were tasked with creating the job, basically the job ads, notices of vacancies, they call them, NOVs. Uh, so I uh, made a, a Google pay or Google uh, <laughs> a Google Doc for that, and then I invited my rhetoric colleagues in there, and I said, look, comment on it, edit it, however you see fit. And most of them would come in. They didn't want to edit my text I put up there. Uh, instead, they'd make these little comments on the side, you know, asking questions or making suggestions. And then, uh, you know, of course, they were very constructive comments. Nobody was being uh, rude or anything like that. Uh, but then I could go in and make the change, and then I can re reply to the comment or ask for a follow-up. So the key is this. You know, it's very easy in an online situation to forget <laughs> that there's that, these are actual people you're dealing with. So all the same stuff we talked about before, you know, being super polite, 
uh, not rushing to judgment, keeping our emotions in check, uh, stepping away, you know, or switching to a different channel if there's uh, been some confusion. You know, all that stuff still applies. You know, if you make a, if you see somebody, <laughs> you make a very uh, harsh comment, you might just say, well, I'm just being matter of fact. You know, I'm just telling it like it is. You know, that might, might, might be how you feel, but maybe the person that sees that suggestion might get really uh, offended by it, uh, take it in a way you didn't expect. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things that can happen that wouldn't be good for, for anybody. So again, it always, <laughs> always this air on the side, just be super polite, super nice, because you never know uh, how somebody's going to react to things, especially if you are having to point out, look, <laughs> basically you're wrong here. Uh, it needs to be this instead. You know, nobody likes being corrected. Uh, nobody likes that. <laughs> they may say they do, but I just, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical. <laughs> so if you have to correct somebody, uh, you really try the best you can to be respectful about it, be nice about it, and uh, you know, don't create a necessary conflict. Let's see, problems with discussion forums. So I don't know how familiar you are with these, but that's one of the things I liked about Drupal. Uh, you could have these discussion boards set up. You know, and we use them on D2L all the time, right? Uh, I was just talking about one. Uh, but there's some problems people can get into, basically flame, what they call flame, flame wars. So these are basically ways to avoid that, you know, where people go off topic, they start attacking each other. Uh, it can get pretty nasty. So the first one is avoid the uh, leading posts. Uh, just like a questionnaire, you don't, you don't want leading questions. You know, if you're there trying to gather information, you don't want to... Uh, you know, contaminate the, uh, the was it, was it taint the pot? <laughs> I forget the exact uh, expression for that, but you know, you want to come across as genuinely seeking. You got an open mind. You're just asking for information about this. You're not trying to uh, write propaganda. Propaganda. Uh, avoid ignoring competing points of view. You know, this this you know this is something I think about too. If, even if somebody disagrees with you on this forum, you know that person took the time to write that response. You know, they're, they're probably uh, anxious about how you're going to take their uh, disagreement. You know, so you don't want to, if you just ignore it and move on, uh, that can just make them feel bad. Or it might even make them angry uh, that you're not uh, respecting their opinion. Now, notice it doesn't say you have to agree with it. Just don't ignore it. Uh, avoiding the strong, rigid language. Like, you don't want to say something's ridiculous, for example. Uh, avoid complaining. Now, this is a big one, and this, uh, you know, I'll never forget this discussion forum. <laughs> I ran into some big trouble uh, when I was a grad student. Uh, we had this, what they called the student discussion forum, and supposedly this was just nothing but students on this forum. You know, the faculty was not supposed to be looking at this. Well, you, you can guess what happened. You know, I was uh, <laughs> writing, writing some negative, not even that bad of stuff, you know, but just some negative things about a class I was taking. Uh, next thing you know, I was asked about it uh, by the professor in question. You know, some of the, one of my classmates had forwarded that to them. <laughs> I got into a lot of trouble about it. And, you know, I could say, well, it was unethical. They shouldn't have forwarded that. Uh, professor shouldn't have read it. You know, all, I could say that all day long, but I mean, the point is, uh, I should have known better than to be complaining in this sort of open forum. Don't You can't trust uh, that somebody's not going to, to pull that kind of uh, <laughs> shenanigan on you. Uh, so basically, just don't put it in writing, is uh, my advice. Uh, really, just though, and I'll say this, I would never do that now because I, I think it's a better philosophy just not to complain all the time. You know, don't be negative about things. It really seldom does any good. And it probably will just come back to, to bite you anyway. It's the avoiding of blaming. Uh, yeah, you don't want to blame, throw people under the bus. You know, this isn't just discussion. <laughs> it's just life. <laughs> Good life advice, right? Don't blame people. Uh, people generally know when they've made a mistake, and they don't need you to keep reminding them of that or, uh, again, trying to throw them under the bus. Uh, that just makes it worse. Uh, avoiding the off-topic points. You want to keep the discussions going, being productive, and <laughs> you know, if you indulge somebody that's off topic, next thing you know, you've derailed the post. Uh, avoiding excessively short or lengthy posts. Uh, if it's too short, you know, I don't 
I guess if they if they might think you're being curt, <laughs> you know, somebody writes you a big question, you just say yes <laughs> or no. <laughs> uh, that might uh, offend them somehow. Uh, and of course, if you write something really lengthy, they just won't read it. Yeah, avoiding the sarcasm. Again, this is just not something that's good, and especially in a professional communication situation, to be sarcastic with somebody it might make you feel better at the, in the moment, uh, but it's not professional. It just makes you look bad. And, and again, it's all online. You don't know how people are going to take it. Uh, they might take that literally, uh, that sarcastic comment, and that could uh, uh, be embarrassing for everybody. All right, let's see. Strategies for making uh, forms effective. Uh, yeah, reading the comments completely and carefully, <laughs> you know, especially if it makes you angry at first, go back, look at it again, uh, make sure you're reading it correctly. Then you're not, sometimes your mind just imagines, this happened to me, I, I'll imagine there's some words there that aren't even there. It's just, it's weird. I go back and reread it and I say, that, was, was I hallucinating? <laughs> what is going on? They didn't even say that. Uh, it's just my brain kind of jumping to conclusions. And so again, a good, Good time to you know, take a break, go take a walk, come back, look at it again. Uh, state the purpose of the forum clearly. Uh, flexible, open, inviting language, right? Avoiding all that leading question stuff, the harsh language. Uh, building on the ideas of others and pose questions. You know, this is a good seminar tip as well if you're in one of those seminar classes. Uh, so don't think about your contribution as being totally separate than everybody else's. A lot of times it's great, you know, if this student asks a question, you know, professor answers the question, uh, then you can frame your response, you know, along those lines. So you could just, you know, literally say, well, along those lines, <laughs> you know, like, like Pete was saying, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and if you can connect it back, you know, I kind of think about this as they talk about threading, right? So when the threads, you want to have the stitches in between the, uh, the post, to keep those well connected uh, with each other. And that, that's a lot better than, again, that, this will keep you from going off topic uh, keep this uh, forum from getting uh, chaotic. Uh, showing appreciation from teammates and their ideas. You know, thank you for your post. <laughs> Don't forget, it takes time to write this. Even if you disagree with it, you know, you should be thankful they cared enough to uh, write the post. Uh, participating regularly. Yeah, meet in real time for touchy points. So again, if you can tell somebody's gotten upset, the last thing you want to do is compound it by coming back to the forum and keep posting on it. You know, at that point, you want to meet the face-to-face, -face, phone call, <laughs> whatever. Uh, don't just keep compounding it by uh, posting there or keep uh, coming back to that point. Uh, summarizing is appropriate. Identify next steps. Uh, talk with the team to make forums, uh, how to make forums more productive, right? Figure out, <laughs> you know, is there a problem? Now, so here we have effective example of a forum conversation. And it's... I don't know how this looks on your screen. It's a little blurry to me, so I might just have you, <laughs> you know, look on the look in the book at 8.7. But oh man, I feel like I'm at the eye doctor. <laughs> so let's see, what should our policy be for front desk employees providing refunds? So you can see how that's an open question. It's friendly. It's not using any kind of a leading question or doesn't have harsh language. A little bit about the topic there, and this uh, person that responds says. I agree with Kip that we can't afford to lose value. So that's that stitch I was talking about, right? They're kind of stitching it to that post. And then the next one says, thank you, Kip and Nancy. And so she's connected it to those two. And so you see they're following all this stuff. They're not getting off topic. They're not blaming people for stuff. It's just a productive conversation. I mean, this is the ideal, probably a little bit too ideal, but uh, <laughs> you get the point. All right, writing post uh, for your organization. So this is actually more realistic than you might think. Uh, a lot of companies, and I've known several people, several of my former students have gone on to be uh, social media coordinators or so social media managers. There's like a hundred names for it. Uh, but basically, they're, they're hired to run that company's social media. And when, they, when they're doing that, they have to understand that it's not just their personal views anymore. They're representing that company, uh, that organization. It's, called PR, uh, public relations. And you're basically that point of contact between that company and sometimes the outside world, or at least their client base or their, their customers. And so it's it's very lofty position to be in uh, when you really think about it. But <laughs> 
you know, ultimately it is though just about building the relationships. It's a different way. It's not all that fundamentally different than uh, if you watch The Office a TV show, you see some people. Who is it? Stanley. He's always on the phone. You know, that's how he likes to build relationships. He's a phone guy. <laughs> uh, whereas other people, uh, who is it? Uh, uh, the intern. Uh, I forget, blanking on his name. Ben Novak, I think is the actor. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm a lot more tech savvy uh, ways of building relationships. But at the end of the day, it's all about building those uh, relationships, right? And there's a two prong goal to it it's to improve the corporate reputation or credibility, uh, but that, that's the primary goal. But they also talk about the need to differentiate that. Let's see if we get into that here. So anyway, first, the corporate reputation. So that's the intangible asset that allows the company to better manage the expectations and needs of various stakeholders. Yeah, there we go. Creating different, differenti <laughs> differentiation <laughs> and barriers uh, via V its competitors. So you can think about Wendy's. I love uh, Wendy's and Burger King and, and McDonald's. Uh, so they're all kind of in the fast food business. And they've, uh, you know, obviously got all the social media people working, you know, getting paid no telling how much <laughs> to try to manage his corporate reputation. Uh, so the uh, the idea is it's not just, you don't they, they don't want you just to say, oh, McDonald's. What a great company. You know, I, they have a great reputation. <laughs> it's not just that. I mean, obviously they want that. Uh, but they're also trying to create personalities. Like, I mean, they want you to think about Wendy's in a diff as different, you know, and Burger King's kind of got this wacky thing going on. Uh, and Wendy's is kind of the, the playing this kind of sarcastic uh, role on social media. Uh, so people that eat that up, you know, they really, you know, it gets us talking about Wendy's, when, which is a good thing for them. I mean, they don't want to just disappear. <laughs> you know, we just, I was just reading the Shopco. Uh, it seemed like that store is kind of on the way out, kind of closing down. And it could just be this kind of stuff, right? They didn't really do a good, maybe they had a reputation for being honest and reliable and that sort of thing, but it was that differentiation that was a problem. You know, it's not different. And how is this different uh, than shopping at, you know, Walmart, Target, you know, all these other options? So maybe they, they failed there. So for stakeholders, the intellectual, emotional, and behavior response as to whether or not the communications and actions resonate with their needs and interests. So, you know, Wendy's has this <laughs> Twitter feed. <laughs> uh, so if, if you subscribe to Wendy's Twitter feed and, and you like it, you laugh about it and share those posts, obviously that's working, it's resonating. Uh, whereas if it was just boring stuff and you took a look at the Twitter feed and you like, ah, I don't care about that. <laughs> it's just a bunch of dying information uh, or it's just a sort of company announcements. It wouldn't resonate with you. Uh, and it wouldn't have any impact on you. Let's see, a press release style blog post. Uh, so you can basically, the argument here is this was just kind of like what they would send to the uh, newspapers. It's just kind of a uh, typical PR stuff uh, as I would think about it. And so you could see uh, the award-winning Prestigio Market Restaurant just turned up the heat. Uh, head Chef, blah, 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 three new menu items last week. So basically, it's kind of informational. It's also, you know, obviously some marketing going on here. It doesn't seem like just somebody's personal opinion. You can sort of tell <laughs> uh, that it's not just uh, a person writing that. It's kind of almost like the company's writing it. Now, like, compare that, though, to this op-ed style blog post. Uh, here we've got two people are writing this and they talk about um, sort of their experiences here. You can see where they're talking about people that questions they've been asked, uh, the planner commented to them, and then they talk about their accomplishments there. Yes, green meetings make a difference. <laughs> they're better for environment and better for the pocket book. So this is, reads more like something that would be in the op-ed column. <laughs> of the newspaper. I don't know if that means anything to people anymore. You know, I, I still like to read the op-eds in, in the newspaper. Uh, but you can see it's a little bit more conversational. It's a little bit more of a person's opinion as opposed to just reading a, a basically an advertisement, uh, just pure marketing. All right, guidelines for using social media in the workplace. Uh, so actively contribute and join the uh, relevant communities. That's probably the biggest one. 
you know, if you don't join the, the page, if you don't subscribe to it, then you won't be involved. Uh, read, listen, and learn. You know, especially when, if you're new, I would definitely say just read and listen for a while before you start jumping in and trying to participate. You know, get a feel for the uh, type of community that is, uh, what's what's acceptable, what's a, what's a good style, what's a good tone to use. Uh, so read and listen for a while first. Uh, focus on the content or what it is you need to say. Uh, making the content accessible, everything from bulleted lists, not using jargon if people want to understand the jargon, etc. Uh, making messages authentic and friendly. Uh, so you don't want to sound like a robot or what we call corporate speak. <laughs> Trying to sound like a person. Uh, be responsive and help other people. Uh, that'll go a lot further than you think. Uh, respecting the boundaries and avoiding oversharing. Right, so if this is a company-wide list, company-wide uh, discussion forum, uh, if you keep talking about, you know, too much about stuff going on in your personal life, other people might, it's not just, you know, it's not just about being offended. It might be just kind of wasting people's time, right? They, you know, they're, they're forced, they're required to have to read these announcements. <laughs> uh, so it should be brief. It shouldn't be much of stuff that's basically irrelevant to your job. People don't like that. Uh, personal brand, uh, a unique set of professional skills and attributes that others associate with you. So you kind of have that company brand. You know, if you work for Google, Google kind of has a reputation, kind of a personality or Wendy's or whatever. Uh, but you yourself have that as well. That's called your personal brand. And it's especially important nowadays where people are shifting from job to job. You know, it's, it's kind of unusual these days just to work at one company. Uh, most people might work freelance or they have a LinkedIn profile, you know, they're kind of looking for <laughs> for work elsewhere. And so it's worthwhile thinking about this personal brand. And let's see, personal and private. So positive meta messages and sought after reputations. So you might be developing a blog or you might have a Facebook page that's open to the public or maybe certain parts of it are open to the public. And somebody's looking at this page, your blog, and they're kind of inferring certain things about you, right? Things that aren't necessarily explicitly said, but that are shown by that blog. So like, I'm a good listener. We're the same thing with the discussion forums, right? You know, I'm a good listener. You're not just posting stuff all the time, but you're replying to things that other people have posted. That shows you're a good listener. Or same thing with I can take care of you. I hope the best for you, caring, competence, character. You know, we talked about those aspects before. Uh, so obviously, the, what you want to be perceived as is communicative, good interpersonal skills, somebody who's dependable, somebody who's considerate, caring, uh, loyal, <laughs> trustworthy, you know, all this stuff. Uh, so really think about what you post. And after this, I would encourage you to take a look at your Facebook page or your LinkedIn profile or whatever it is. And, and think, you know, what would somebody that wasn't you, that was just kind of looking at this conversation, what would they infer about you? What kind of person would they assume is writing this stuff? You know, do you come across as uh, somebody who gets the job done, has competence, is competent, skilled, dependable, <laughs> bringing out the best, somebody who cares, somebody who's ethical? Well, there's a lot of these. <laughs> uh, personal and public for society social networking websites such as uh, Facebook. Yeah, so you have certain abilities. They can see what your job is, I suppose. You're talented, skilled, you're capable. You know, if you're posting about some achievements, uh, they can see this and congratulate you. You have certain interests, right? If you have the, a lot of photos of your uh, self playing uh, football <laughs> or golfing, <laughs> you know, they can see this. Uh, determined focus. I want to share my experiences. I want to learn about you. Yeah, so asking questions about people, not just, it's not just the me show starring me, <laughs> but uh, you're trying to get to know people, right? You're curious about other people. Uh, you want to get to know them. You have certain social values and priorities, right? So again, it's not, you're not just a cog in a wheel, uh, but you've got certain causes that you care about. Maybe nothing directly related to, to the job, but something you're passionate about. Maybe you volunteer at the Humane Society is one that I think a lot about. I have a lot of students that are very interested in that, very active uh, in the Humane Society. They're passionate about animals, and you know, that's fine. 
Uh, I live my life according to certain beliefs. Yeah, moral understanding. <sighs> Expertise, thought leader. <laughs> I want to lead a professional discussion. Shows you have good leadership. Initiative, generous. I want to understand your experiences. Learning, inquisitive, curious. Uh, committed to the industry. Professional, passionate, committed. So maybe this is where the, uh, for me, that Kairos News kind of kicked in. Kind of said, I'm not just the typical student that's just there to get the homework done and make the grade. You know, I've gone above and beyond that with this blog here. I'm really trying to build up a professional reputation uh, for composition and technology. All right, a lot of information there, but <laughs> I think it all makes sense. It's good to think about, I guess, in general, the sort of meta meta message that you're sending out. Uh, so not explicitly, one, not just looking at a single post or explicitly what you say, but just imagining yourself as a reader coming across this discussion forum. What would they? What would be their takeaway? What would they assume about you based on what you've posted there? All right, ethical use of social media. And so yeah, more than your online reputation is at stake. Uh, the reputation and performance of the company is at stake as well. I'm not going to go down the long litany. <laughs> There's just countless examples nowadays of you know, somebody in a company posts something inappropriate to Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And it's not just enough. It's not just, well, we can fire that person. You know, yeah, you can fire that person, but to some extent the damage has been done. Right, and that company will bear the brunt of that. Uh, even if they fire that individual, uh, you know that, that reputation is going to be going to stick around for a long time. So they're kind of hyper sensitive about this, uh, this idea. Uh, so the, the line between what you believe is private use of social media and your role as an employee can be murky because your private actions can damage your employer and hurt your uh, career. Yeah, so just countless examples again of this. <laughs> Elon Musk on the Joe Rogan show. Uh, smoking pot, uh, probably not the best, <laughs> the best thing for Tesla. <laughs> he could say, "Look, this just—I did this on my personal time. This has nothing to do with the job, etc." Uh, nevertheless, it can kind of uh, impact that. You know, if I was, uh, you know, I always think it's kind of silly, really. People kind of hold up teachers and professors as being these—they uh, want—they want to think of a, if you're a teacher, that must mean you're this saintly person who who never engages in anything. <laughs> other than learning <laughs> and teaching, right? Of course, we all have lives. Uh, nobody's you know, angelic. Uh, the, the point is, though, you probably don't want to be posting, uh, you know, pictures of yourself <laughs> at some kind of big drinking party, uh, much less, uh, you know, if there's drugs involved and that sort of thing. You probably don't want that on your social media page because, you know, you can argue all day long about, look, this is just my personal page. Uh, this has nothing to do with my job. You, know, you can argue that until you're blue in the face, but people will still uh, make that connection. Uh, so he, <laughs> you can either make sure you can you can just double down on the privacy, uh, make sure double sure you got nothing like that posted publicly. Uh, your, your account is rigidly secure, to all the authentication you want, blah blah blah. Uh, but I would still argue, you know, stuff will get out. All right. Anyway, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> uh, chapter takeaways. Uh, we talked about the characteristics of the social age, this idea that you know, all this new media, you know, even the fact that new media, the term is kind of obsolete. <laughs> like that sounds kind of old fashioned to be talking about new media already. Wow. You know, maybe it is kind of a fundamental shift as big as like the printing press was uh, to culture. And we talked about blogs, wikis, forums, ways to effectively communicate, basically some problems to <laughs> avoid too. Now uh, using blogs, now, the idea of an online reputation, you know, the meta, the meta message <laughs> that you're sending to people that you may not be aware of. And I think that's the key. You might not have really thought about it. And so after this, go back and look at some of the stuff you've posted online, whether for this class or elsewhere. And, you know, just ask, you know, what kind of mes meta messages is that sending? And then, of course, the ethical uh, use of the social media. You know, you're keeping private what's supposed to be private. Are you not <laughs> wasting people's time? Uh, you know, obviously not, not using it for some kind of illicit purposes, obviously. Uh, but it's really thinking not just about yourself and, you know, your immediate concerns, but how does how might this reflect on the company you work for, uh, the organization? 
All right, I think that's quite a bit of material. I'm really, I'm sure you have lots of fun stories, or maybe not so fun stories that have happened to you that involve this topic. Love to hear those. I'd like to hear your opinions, thoughts, questions, whatever it is you have about the topic. I'd love to hear that. So post that on the feed, and I'll get back to you. Anyway, I hope you're having a great day, and see you next time.